<clears throat> Y'all pray for me. <clears throat> to be well known of men, I may not ever be, and I'm sure my name will not go down in history there'll be no marble plaques to tell of my good deeds nor any great parades to honor me but there's a record book my name is written in it was recorded there when I was born again. No one can blot it out. It's sealed forevermore. It's in that book of life kept by the Lord. For every deed I do, for every word I say, there is a record kept until the judgment day. My name will not be lost, misplaced or overlooked, for it's kept safely in God's record book. For there's a record book my name is written in. And it was recorded there when I was born again. No one can blot it out. It's sealed forevermore. It's in that book of life kept by the Lord. For there's a record book my name is written in. It was recorded there when I was born again. No one can blot it out. It's sealed forevermore. It's in that book of life kept by the Lord.
Please open your Bibles to John chapter 1. Now, if the pastor knew that I was going to speak in tongues today, he probably wouldn't have invited me. But uh, I've got an interpretation. That is, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. That truth, the truth in that scripture is literally the answer to every problem on this earth. You know, I was driving down the road, we were going to a church, and I saw a sign that says, Jesus is the answer to all of your problems. You know, we use that expression just to say, oh, this is the answer to all your problems. We mean that to say something very good. But you know, literally, that is true. That if you have Jesus, you have the answer to all of your problems. And let me make sure that you know this, that if you don't have Him, your problems have only just begun. He is literally the, the solution to life. But you know what? I want you to think about something else. I can say that verse and think about another verse. I can say that verse and think about what I'm going to eat for lunch tomorrow. That verse is so familiar to me. I've heard it over and over and over. But there are people in this world who have never heard that Scripture, the truth of that Scripture, one time. You're right. They have never had a chance to believe on the One who came into this world for them. That's right. And so that is the reason why we need to take the Gospel to those places in this world who do not have it. And China is one of those places. And Lily and I, uh, we're the Smiths, and God has called us. And Lord willing, we are going to go to China to tell people about Jesus. Yeah. And so that's, that's why we're here. Um, but first, before I begin, let me warn you that I am not a southern preacher. I don't have that fire. <laughs> I grew up in Wyoming, and everybody out there, nobody breathed. And the preacher was just didn't even move. And so I'm going to try my best. But um, I just love southern, I love the southern churches, and I wish I had that fire. But, uh, but you know what? There's hope, because the power is not in the man, it's in the Word. And so, Lord willing, Lord help me to speak His Word tonight. But first, let me give a little testimony. What has God done in our lives? That's important. Um, first of all, my wife Lily, she was born in China, a small town, 25 million people. Actually, that's not true. It's more like 35 million. The city of Shanghai. Um, that is just a, a huge city. And the scary thing is that everybody goes to work on Monday. And so that is a, that is a different culture than I grew up in. I grew up in a town of 5,000. But my wife was born in a, uh, in a family that was into Buddhism. And Buddhism is a terrible, terrible thing. Um, it, is, it is not just an idea. Uh, it is a demonic thing. It is something that keeps people from the one who created them. Amen. And you know what? It's not any different than a person who sits in church and hears the gospel and rejects it. Right. Anything that keeps us from Christ is of the devil. Amen. And so, but God did a work in her life. Her, one of her relatives came to her house and they told her and her mom about Jesus and eventually she believed and God has changed her heart and she wants to go back and take the gospel to China with, hey. with me. Hey. Uh, let me tell you something about myself. Uh, my, when I was a young boy, my mom said, Andy, come with me. We got in the car and she was driving and she turned and she said, Andy, I don't care what she thinks. I need to tell her about Jesus. My mom was taking the gospel to a friend who was dying of cancer. And you know, I was about six years old at that time. I was just a little boy, and I, don't, I wasn't saved at that time. But you know what? My mother had a huge influence in my life. You know, those, little, those kids are watching, parents. They're watching you. And even those small things, that made a huge influence on my life. You know, my mom was not perfect, of course. But you know what? God used her. Through that imperfect woman, I saw a perfect God who she trusted in. You know, I can stand up here and smile and say, I'm a happy person. There's joy in my life. And you might look at me and say, wow, Andy's happy. He's joyful. But you don't really know. No. You would have, you'd have to spend time with me. And you know what? I watched my mom growing up. I watched that woman. And there was a joy in her heart that was real. And I could not deny it. And so let me just say as encouragement, God taught me this. 
that what you do as a parent, it is so effect. It is You're such right. a big influence on that You're child. Right. You know, if a parent says, you know what, I need to get my life right. I need to start serving God. Those kids are watching. And they're like, yeah. I want to do that too. Right. Maybe they don't understand it, but they're watching. And I'm a product of that. I'm a godly parent. When I was in uh, high school, my parents went to a church where the pastor would open up the Bible and do something very dangerous. He would preach the gospel. And you know what? The gospel does not just change your life. I mean, join the army. That'll change your life. Get a new job. That'll change your life. Do drugs. Your life will be changed. But you know what? The gospel raises the dead. Yeah. You know, when Jesus yeah. spoke to that grave and says, Lazarus, come on out of there. Yeah. That wasn't just reviving a, a, a person who was just sick. He, that was life, a new life. And so when I heard the gospel and I believed there was a new birth in my heart and I know that I was saved. I know that I, I know that I know because there was a change in my heart. You know, there's, when a person gets saved, they don't become a perfect person. There's still sinful, there's still sinful temptations. There's still struggles. But there's a new desire. And I, my relationship with sin was different. I did not see it as normal anymore. I did not see it as something that I was, that I that I thought I could do without being, uh, my conscience being, just felt terrible. I wanted to serve God. I wanted to please God. But you know what? There is an enemy that does not want us to believe. There's an enemy that does not want us to serve God. And you know, for about six years after I got saved, I struggled, and it was a spiritual struggle, and I doubted that I was actually saved. I know that I was. But you know what? I thought, how could God forgive me for all the things that I thought, said, and did? And you know what? The devil, he, he, can, mail, he can build a really good case against us. He, is, he can build a, a case so well that any righteous judge must condemn us. But you know what? There is an advocate who speaks on our defense. Amen. Hallelujah. And I remember I was in the car one day. I was driving. I remember exactly where I was, that turnpike. And God gave me a word from His Scripture. And it was that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive. Yeah. And at that moment, I realized something. I wasn't believing God. I was calling God a liar. I was saying, God, I know what Your Word says, but You can't do that. And at that moment, I realized I need to start believing His Word. Amen. I need yeah. to start believing the yeah. promises of yeah. God. It was yeah. just that simple. Immediately, the problem was solved because I just simply believed His Word and said, God, that's what you said. I'm going to believe it. Yeah. What an awesome lesson to learn in life, just to believe yeah. God's Word. Yeah. Believe the promises You're of God. Right. You know, if, if Israel would have just believed God, how much, how much different would the Old Testament be? It would be really short. It would be like two pages. <laughs> I mean, if they would have just simply believed God who never lies. I mean, His name is faithful and true. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's His name. Yeah. Yes, sir. What are we doing not believing God? I'm telling you, how many promises are in the Scripture? One of those promises can change your life forever. You're right. Thank you. Is You're that not right. true? I mean, just imagine one truth. God, you can forgive my sin. That changed my life. I was freed to serve God. I knew that God wanted me in heaven. I mean, imagine if you don't think God wants you in heaven. How can you fully invest your, put your affections on things above? There you go. And you know what? When I believed God, I, I was freed. I can say, God, I can serve you now. God, you love me and you want me in your kingdom. That's right. And how many promises are in the Scripture? We need to just go home tonight, lay on our beds and say, God, where am I not believing your word? That would be a good thing to do. Yeah. Every day. That's good. And then we just need to dig through here. And it's like digging through a pile of gold. I mean, it's not like digging through dirt to find gold. It's all gold. There's full of promises. What a, what a great lesson to learn that God did in my life. And I'm still working on it. But it was, uh, I was working at a job and I was miserable. And I think God put me there because He didn't want me to stay there. And I remember, I remember praying. I said, God, I want to serve you. If you want me to go to China, send me to China. And guess what God said? He pulled out the slingshot. He was like, all right. And He sent me to China. It was like a year later. I was in, I was in the university studying Chinese. And that's a different story. But uh, that's how God sent me to China. And when I got to China, you know, before I got to China, I was not a very bold guy. But you know what? When I hit ground in China, guess what happened? I was still that same guy. I'm still not very bold. 
I mean, you think about it. You get up in the plane, you go over, you come down, you get off the plane. How much different can you be, right? Some, some idea we think, oh, when you go abroad to do something for the Lord, oh, you're just going to be like this new man, a missionary. No. What you are here is the same. You'll be the same guy, right? Yeah. Yep. And so, you know, God had to work on my heart. It was about six years. You know, when you go to China, there's a fear that is put upon you. There's a fear that people put upon you. They'll tell you, you can't do that in China. They're going to persecute you. They're going to kick you out. You know, they're going to say, you can't share the gospel. You know, if you're a teacher in the university, you can't share the gospel to students. And I'm like, I don't know, maybe that's true. And I was believing that stuff. And for six years, I didn't do anything for the Lord. But you know what? The Bible does not teach us that attitude. He does not, the Bible doesn't teach us that lifestyle. The 007 Christian. Secret handshake at the door. Instead of baptism, we're going to have a water party. You know, the Bible doesn't teach us that. You know what the Bible teaches us? It says, For unto you it is given in behalf of Christ not only to believe on Him, but to suffer for His sake. Yeah. There's an important word in there. It didn't say, you know what, if you want to, you can believe on Him, but now you have to pay the price and suffer. That's not what it says. It says, it is given unto you. It is a gift yes, that you could suffer for Him. Yeah. I had a friend who was, uh, she loved this athlete, and one day she found a piece of garbage that had the athlete's initials on it. And she was like, whoa, look at this. She put it on her shelf, it became a treasure. That piece of garbage. To me, it was garbage. I was like, what in the world? That's garbage, throw it away. Why to me was it garbage, but to her it was a treasure? You know, suffering is not th something desirable. I don't want to wake up, I don't wake up in the morning saying, I want to suffer. I just don't. I wake up in self-preservation mode. I think we all do, right? I mean, I take my vitamins, I buy health insurance, I buckle my seatbelt. Oh, this is kind of a scary neighborhood, let's go around. I mean, I live in that way. But what does the scripture say? Remember those disciples who came out, they suffered for the Lord, and they said, Thank you, Lord, that we were, we were counted worthy to suffer for your name. That is the attitude. You know what that tells me? The glory of the one that we serve is so great that even the suffering is a joy. Amen. And yeah. that is the attitude. Yeah. If we can take upon ourselves that attitude, what is there in this world that we cannot face? Right. Right? right. I mean, if suffering becomes a joy, right. if suffering becomes a joy, we have conquered life. Yes. Sir. Right? We just need to fix our eyes on that one. Right? If I look at this world and I think suffering is a terrible thing, avoid it at all costs. If I look upon the Lord, I say, Lord, I want to serve you. Thank you for letting me serve you. And so that is the attitude that we must have if we're going to do something for the Lord. Yes. And persecution isn't just for China. It should be the normal part of a Christian life. If we are living in a dark world and we are glorifying the Lord and living for His glory, we should suffer persecution Amen. to some extent. Amen. Jesus said, suffer, uh, consider the cost, right? We need to count the cost. That means think about what you might suffer and think, right? We don't want to think about that, but Jesus said you should, yeah. right? Amen. So anyway, uh, in China, uh, my wife and I got married, and that's another story. I'm not going to go through all that. But we got married. She said yes. She said no, and I said that's the wrong answer. Then she, I gave her another chance. She changed her answer. And so, uh, right? That's what happens. Short story. Short story long. Long story short. Um, but in China, there's a problem in the churches. Uh, I'm just, there are some great things happening in China with the underground churches. But when I was there, there was a problem that really we struggled with, and that is that they, they're not training the men to serve. Most of the churches you go to, it's probably about 80% women. The guys are in the back sleeping, or they're not even there. And so, you know, maybe the wives are up there pastoring the church. And so we were in these churches, and I'm like, you know, the Bible's pretty clear about this. I mean, the, the men need to be leading their homes, loving their wives, and be strong in the word and leading in the church. And they looked at me and said, that's your culture. I was like, let me check again. And I go back to the word and the word would not leave me, let me go. And so finally, it was such a struggle. I said, you know what? Look, Lord, what are we going to do? Please give us a church that we can go to or I can take my wife to. And you know what the Lord did? He led us up to 
uh, one of the northeastern cities in Dalian. Uh, it was about two hours west of North Korea, and we met a church planner, some missionaries, and we helped and served and helped with their church plan for about two years, and now we're coming back to get more training so we can go back and do the same thing. There is such a great need in China. You think 1.4 billion people. You know, there's, people say there's a lot of Christians in China, but the percentage is very low. They say about 5%. That's what the CIA website says. But you know what? I don't believe that. Because, you know, the CIA does not distinguish between true gospel and false gospel. Right. They don't distinguish between works-based salvation and trusting in what Christ did for us. Hey, right? right? And they also include some of those cults that shouldn't even be tagged with any name related to Christ. Right? So I right. think the numbers are much, much lower. Hey. There is such a great need. So many people who have never heard the gospel. So our desire, Lord willing, we will go in there and preach the gospel disciple one-on-one -on -one and raise up leaders and if we get kicked out the ministry can go on and so that's our goal but I want to look at a quick scripture here um, I want to look at an, probably the most amazing and important statement ever made ever in the Bible John chapter 1 verse 29 John chapter 1 verse 29 this one verse it says the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Amen. Yes. Amen. What an amazing statement. First of all, let's talk about the man who makes this statement. You know, if my brother came up to me and said, Andy, go do this, I would flick him in the nose and say, Do it yourself. Because that's my brother. But if he said to me, Dad said, Okay, that's different. I'm going to go do it. Right? The authority makes a difference. Yeah. You know what? Right. Let's look at the man who speaks here. John 1, chapter, uh, John chapter 1, verse 6. It says, There was a man sent from God. This is John. Uh -huh. This is God's prophet. This is God's delivery boy. He's delivering God's message. This is not man's message about God. There's a lot of opinions about God out there. But this is God's message to man. Don't tell me God doesn't speak. He speaks. Not only does he speak, but he sent him. He came into this world himself. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Amen. There's the man, uh, the, the person who speaks. What about the picture in this thing? The, the Lamb of God. This is an amazing thing. You know, the Jews, to us, we think lamb, we think lamb chop. Or, you know, we don't have, we don't really have that... Uh, idea in our mind as much as they did, but the Jews understood the lamb, the sacrificial lamb. I mean, even from the beginning, remember those two brothers? There was Cain, there was Abel. God told them what to do, and then Abel, what did he do? He said, God, I want to worship you. Don't get me wrong. I'm going to worship you, but I'm going to worship you in my own way. So he goes, gets his vegetables, and he offers them to God. And what, is, what does God say to Cain? Yay. Yeah, I'll accept that. You're sincere. You know, you're trying hard. Is that what he said? No. Uh, that's not what I want. Rejected. Right? Amen. And then Abel, he, said, he hears what God says and says, God, okay, you want the lamb. And by faith, don't, don't mistake in that, it was by faith. Faith did not begin in the New Testament. Salvation has always been by faith. Hearing the word of God and then responding. His actions showed his faith. He wasn't saved by works. Nobody can be saved by works. But he heard the word of God. He didn't understand completely, I'm sure, because he didn't have all that we have. But he said, God, this is what you want. I offer the lamb. And what does God say? That's what I want. And it wasn't the thing itself. It was what the thing represented. When God saw that lamb, he was smelling that savor of the one who would to come. And die on that cross. Amen. Amen. Right? It's the Lamb. And there are some people even today who are going to church and they are saying, God, I'm going to worship you. I'm going to, do, I'm going to worship you, but in my own way. And they're bringing their, their own righteousness to God and their own works. Oh, man, that is a scary thing. There's only one way that we can come to God, and that is to Christ. Say, Amen. God, this is how I come to you. I, I offer Him up to you. And God says, that's how I can forgive you. Because He is the... the the Lamb of God, the spotless Lamb who was crucified for us. Amen. 
And then all through the Old Testament, we see pictures of the Lamb, right? We see Abraham saying, God will provide himself the Lamb. And God provided the Lamb himself. He is the Lamb. He is the one who came into this world. He provided. And then we, talk, we see the Passover. And there's some interesting things about Chinese culture. The red around the doors during the New Year, they say if they do that, they won't, their crops won't be destroyed. That's very interesting, by the way. And then we go up to John the Baptist. This is an amazing point in history. This is amazing. John says, okay, all those pictures in the Old Testament, guess what? Look over here. There he is. Yeah. This is the Lamb. This is a shifting from picture to person. Yeah. Right? If my wife didn't come today, I would pull out a picture and say, here's my wife. See her? But when she walks in that room, I don't need that picture anymore. I say, behold my wife. Right? What an offense if I, kept, if I pushed her aside and said, look at the picture. Right? That would be ridiculous. The picture is no longer needed. The title stays. I mean, in, look in Revelation, the Lamb of God. He'll be on His throne. Yep. Right? Yeah. But the sacrifice of the animal is done. Right. The one who it represented has come into this world. That is the picture. The provision here that taketh away the sin of the world. I mean, this is it. This is the solution to all man's problems. You know, man knows there's a problem, right? Uh -huh. um, I had a friend who was a Chinese friend, and he said, Andy, I heard you're a Christian. I said, yeah. And he said, I'm not. I'm like, why not? And he said, because if God is so good, why is the world so bad? I thought, that's pretty cool. That is an interesting statement because you, by saying that, admit that you know goodness, you have an understanding of right and righteousness, and you have an understanding of evil that you know the world has a problem. So he was admitting the truth. God is good, but the world has a problem. But there was a conflict, there was a dilemma. He didn't understand how could that be. And you know what? Every one of us deal with that kind of conflict. Things happen in our life, we say, God, you know all things. How could this happen to me? But there's one difference. Yeah. That man didn't mix it with faith. But remember Abraham going up that hill? And God said, take your son and sacrifice. Do you think Abraham understood that? Why? Do you think Abraham thought it was a good idea? I don't think he understood. God, why, this is the promised son you give me. Why am I sacrificing? But God, I'm going to obey you by faith. And so that's how we have to face life. And we have to say, God, when I have troubles, your character is enough. I'm going to trust you. Amen. But the world knows there's a problem, right? And we try it in every way. Philosophy, that's ridiculous. Doesn't solve anything. There's psychology. That's even more ridiculous. The deceitful heart. We're going to ask the deceitful heart, what's the problem? Yeah. Think how ridiculous that is, right? Uh -huh. That's like going to the lady, the fruit seller in China and saying, is the fruit good? She always says yes, no matter what, right? The heart, if I ask my heart, Andy, do you have a problem? No. Am I better than you? Yeah. My heart always tells me good, good, good. I can't trust my heart. I need an outside source. I need that lady that walks up and takes a bite and throws it down and goes to the next fruit seller. I need somebody who knows all things and is always faithful and true. Right here. The Word of God. Yeah. And the Word of God tells us the problem. Right? It's the heart. Right. Sin has separated us from God. And Jesus is the solution. He is the solution. We can go to everywhere in this world, any part of this world, to the ends of the earth, and we have something. The solution to your problems. I can go to every Chinese person and say, believe in Him. Your problems will be solved. You'll have life eternal with God. What a blessing. The solution, the provision, the proportion of it is the world. It says, takes away the sin of the world. Think about when this statement was made. This was in a time when, the, when Israel was thinking, God loves us, all you outsiders. Nah, 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 nah. God's going to destroy you and save us. That's what they thought. Right out of the chute, John comes out and says, Behold the Lamb which takes away the sin of Israel. No. The sin of the world. Yep. Did they miss it here? I mean, there it is, right there. God has a planned salvation for the world. What are we doing? Not taking the gospel to the world. John didn't finish the job, by the way. Um, and the last thing, and this is probably the, the, the final one, the most important that I, I want us just to think about tonight as we go home. That is the, the proclamation. The proclamation. 
John didn't just sit there and look at Jesus and say, oh, that's cool. Everybody was looking at John. I mean, he was a weird guy. He's got locusts in his teeth. He's got honey in his beard. He's got these clothes that are really weird. Everybody's looking at him. And he's like, behold, look upon Jesus and believe the Lamb of God. Revelation chapter 6 tells us something that I think should just keep us awake at night. There is a day where every person in this world is going to behold the Lamb. Everybody is going to look upon His face. It says in uh, Revelation chapter 6 verse 15, 16 and 17, And the kings of the earth, this is when the Lord comes back to judge, by the way. And there is a day when He is going to come back and judge. You know, we live, this, we live our lives as if there is no judgment, even as believers. We live in this haze. You know what? I'll tell you why I don't enjoy watching movies. I mean, even if it's a Disney movie, I cannot feel comfortable watching it. You know why? Because it gives us a picture of a world where there is no judgment. And that is just not true. There is a judgment that is coming upon this world. And every day that goes by, that day is just closer. And there are people that are going to be shut out of the kingdom of God. That day is coming. I don't want to put in my mind a happy world where there is no judgment. Because that is a false idea of reality. In Revelation chapter 6, verse 15, 16, it says, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman... And every freeman hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. On that day they will look upon the Lord's face. And that will be a day where they will look upon him not as their Savior, but as their judge. You know, Noah, he spent a hundred or more years... 120 years building that ark. And there was a day, salvation, the message of salvation was going out. But there was a day when that door shut. And that day is coming. As the Lord is faithful, that day is coming. But it hasn't come today. And so there is a day, even today, there's an opportunity that we can still go to those people who have not believed and say, Behold the Lamb. Amen. I mean, that day is still today. The Lord has given time. He's he's merciful. And so what are we doing with our days? Is that that thought captivating our thoughts wherever we go? Whenever we talk to somebody and say, has this person believed? Have they heard? And what are we doing to take the gospel to those places in the world that have never heard even once? That should be our business. The Lord gave us that business. He gave us the command, and the command is enough. You know, we don't even have to understand it. But the faithful, the character of God and the the authority of God is enough to say, God, I'm going to do it because your character, your your authority, I'm going to go. But that's not all. The Lord gave us a reason. He says, lift up and lift up your eyes and look at the fields. There are people ready to believe. All they need to do is hear. And so what are we doing? Have you looked upon the Lord and believed? Trusted in Him? And if you have, are you proclaiming? Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, your word is true, and it, Lord, helps us to see clearly in this world what we should be doing. And this, Lord, it gives us joy, Lord, that you have, you have removed sin. You've removed that which separates us from you. Lord, thank you so much. Help us to go out and proclaim. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, on the profession of your faith in Him, I baptize my brother, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.
In obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, upon the profession of your faith in Him, I baptize my sister in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Again, I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, you that's finished with us, you can see we're been doing some work in here. Hope the next time you come, we'll have a rest of the winter. We're supposed to put, in, supposed to put them in, in a couple of days, and we'll have it finished. So, y'all come back and see us. Stand with us, please. And y'all shake hands, all the visitors down in fellowship a little while you're standing. You might play a verse or two while they're getting out of here.